Good morning, everyone, and welcome to part two of the Safety Studies course. My name is Mike Fitch with the Ohio LTAP Center here at ODOT, and we appreciate your participation in this training. Please note that today's session is the second of a four-part webinar series with parts three and four next week. As we get started, please take a moment to locate the questions box in the GoToWebinar panel. During the course presentation, please use the questions box to send in any questions you might have, and I'll be dispatching those periodically to the instructors. Please note also that the handout section of your GoToWebinar panel includes PDF copies of the course presentations for reference. With that, we will go ahead and turn things over to Alex Maestros, who is our primary instructor for today's session. Alex, hello. Good morning, Mike. Thanks for the introduction. And good morning, everyone. Uh, we're excited to be back here for day two, module two of the Traffic Academy Safety Studies. As a Sorry, brief reminder, um, the presenter yesterday was Cindy Yerke with Jacobs. My name is Alex Maestros, as Mike said, with Jacobs Engineering Group. Um, we're uh, swapping off between modules one, two, three, and four over the course of the, uh, the four days of this presentation. Um, again, please enter comments into the chat box. Um, they'll be addressed uh, throughout the presentation. We'll take a few breaks for, for questions and to answer them to the group at large. Um, but we also have a chance to answer your questions one-on-one -on -one as they pop up. Quick reminder, in order to receive full credit, attendees must complete all four webinar sessions and successfully complete an online multiple choice test within two weeks after the course completion. Um, and we do ask that you complete that course within the two weeks period and be kind of uh, diligent on getting to that. Um, and then each webinar is worth one and a half hours of either PDH or CPD credit and certificates are typically emailed uh, within one week of the webinar. So as a reminder, yesterday, Cindy covered um, kind of the introduction and background of uh, ODOT safety program as a whole and then safety studies and how they apply to, um, to the safety program here in Ohio. Cindy also went into a background and overview of the Highway Safety Manual. Um, it's where she first touched on a lot of topics that we're going to revisit today. Um, I know yesterday was a lot of, if it's the first time you've encountered the Highway Safety Manual or the HSM, um, it might have seemed like an awful lot, but we'll, we'll break things down a little bit today um, and kind of show how we're going to start applying the Highway Safety Manual principles into the safety studies process. Uh, but before we get to that, we're going to first look at collecting data and diagnosing crash patterns. Um, and then the, the second step will be of today's presentation will be to confirm or identify the potential for safety improvements, which covers safety prediction and all that Part C methodology um, as it applies to ODOT. Alrighty, so this is the, uh, the, the five-step process that Cindy introed yesterday for the ODOT safety study process. Um, the goal for today's presentation is really gonna be a focus on step one, cover that completely, and then we'll, we'll start talking about step two. Step two, in terms of identifying a potential for safety improvements uh, and possible countermeasures, it's a pretty big, broad topic. Um, we'll touch on it today, as well as in module three, and then show some hands-on examples in module four later next week. So in terms of collecting data and analyzing crash reports or crash patterns, what we're gonna do is, is talk about this in a few different ways. Uh, first is what are the historical studies and reports at the site? Um, we'll talk about existing conditions, crash data, summarizing that crash data. Uh, one of the specific ways we wanna summarize that is in collision diagrams. Um, and then a little bit on how we're interpreting crash data and reporting the crash data. And then finally, um, a quick touch on supplemental data. So the, the big thing here is in preparation for a safety study, um, you know, we wanna have an open dialogue with the DSRT, with local partners, with um, local experts as it were. Um, as Cindy mentioned yesterday, from the very beginning, usually uh, when we have these scoping calls, it's really important to take that time not just to hammer out the nuts and bolts of what's gonna be done and covered in the study, but take time to try to start collecting some of that background information. And one of the ways that we wanna do that is to see have there been any previous studies or is there other pertinent information to this site or recent improvements in the site in the study area. Some of the reasons why we wanna cover these things are A, if countermeasures were previously recommended for our study site, we wanna know were they implemented? Were they successful in implementation? Um, if they weren't implemented, why not? 
Um, having that understanding will make each safety study uh, build on top of previous efforts as opposed to replicating them. The last thing that we want to do is go through a safety study process and recommend a whole bunch of countermeasures that we already know can't be implemented because we've been there and tried that. So again, the key is talk to district safety representative uh, members and local authorities. And this is also a good time to talk about who else needs to be engaged. If we're talking with you know, a local engineering group um, and the DSRT from ODOT, you know, that's the right time to say, do we need to talk to law enforcement? Is there, you know, historically issues coming in here? And some of that will be vetted as we look at the crash data, but it's the, the right time to start looking at that background information and gathering, you know, the base level uh, information that we have on the site. So looking at existing conditions for our site, um, really important, particularly at the, at the scoping call and right from the get-go is understand what your study limits are. You know, a lot of times, we know that, oh, I've got five intersections in my city or township or along this road that are really, really a problem. We want to address all five. Um, or we know that we have the corridor Main Street is, is really bad. Um, we get kind of these, these generic assessments of you know, what the problem is. But it's really important that we understand exactly what the study limits are because that's going to impact um, the type of data that we're collecting, what crash data we're collecting. And it really, it's going to impact what HSM sites and subtypes, subsites, um, are going to be evaluated. That's going to have an impact on our data collection. You know, if we're analyzing one small section of roadway versus you know five or six different intersection types, um, it's really going to impact the type of data that we need to collect. And you know, they might be small differences, but we want to make sure that we're thinking ahead. So again, in terms of data needs and collecting information, uh, this is a list of all the things that we really need to collect to be comprehensive in our study. And at first glance, this is a lot of information. Um, and we might be saying, well, is this to collect every HSM subtype or what is, how does this compare with just looking at a site and going out there? Um, and you know, the answer is a lot of this information, everything that we kind of just crossed out in yellow are things that we're gonna wanna consider at the very basic levels of a safety analysis. And so when we start talking about bringing in the Highway Safety Manual and HSM subtypes, we're only talking about a few additional pieces of information that we need to collect when we're either in the field or doing our desktop review of the site. Similarly, in terms of intersections, you know, things like intersection type or traffic volumes, or you know, where are the number of approaches with left and right turn lanes? These are typical geometric features and attributes that we're going to want to take note of, regardless of you know the type of analysis that we're doing. So again, when we bring in that predictive methodology and bringing in the, the HSM into the process, it's only adding a few more pieces of information on top of that base safety analysis that we would do pretty much no matter what. So in terms of data needs, again, the biggest thing is understand the possibility for what we might need to collect in terms of data. And then I think the, the big thing is to say, what what is existing that's good information? Do we have good quality traffic volume information with good turning movement counts that are recent? and representative of current traffic patterns um, versus what are we gonna need to go out and do? Um, one, of the, one of the topics we cover uh, later on in module four is what are the supplemental studies that need to be conducted? But um, the, the, the thing about this five-step process is we need to have an understanding during the scoping and during the data collection kind of of what some of those other uh, traffic and uh, data collection efforts might be. Do we need to scope out turning movement counts at intersections or traffic volume counts? Um, always good to know. So the existing conditions are important because we want to know what the site looks like now. Um, something that often gets overlooked is this safety study, once it's published, completed, and handed off to either ODOT district or local safety partners, is this is a snapshot in time. Um, we're going to have recommendations eventually that are short, medium, and long term, right? And so if we come back to imp implement those long-term countermeasures, just like we want to go back and look at past studies, we need to make sure that our study is representative of what's in the field as we're completing this study. So that, you know, five, six years from now, we can come back to evaluate those long-term countermeasures and say, oh, look at how access points have changed or look at how traffic patterns have changed due to other development. And so it's important that we, we take these existing conditions and document them pretty thoroughly. Um, one of the, the easiest ways to document physical conditions in, in kind of a succinct way is through physical conditions diagrams. Um, 
I know the end goal is to have this this memo or um, word report, research report based uh, document for our safety study, but it's critical that we don't overload the, the final document with text. Um, and uh, we wanna cover everything that's necessary, but a really good physical, physical conditions diagram is a great way to quickly and kind of succinctly capture what's going on out there in the field. Um, this is one example kind of down below in this slide of a physical conditions diagram. Uh, note that they should be to scale in a linear fashion, um, but we might have to exaggerate horizontally for clarity. Um, there, there's different ways that we can present the information. I know um, sometimes we'll do a, a plan and profile type physical conditions diagram if we know that there's potentially some vertical curvature issues. Um, we'll do that using just LIDAR data or something where we're not necessarily sending out a survey crew, but where we can convey the, the, the conditions that are of concern. Um, physical conditions, just like a lot of things that we're going to touch on today, are um, it's, it's kind of a fine line that we need to draw in terms of if we documented every single bit of physical conditions that are in this site, we could absolutely overload this image overlay um, with information. So it's important to kind of remember where are we, why are we here at this site, and what information is going to help us identify potential safety issues. And furthermore, what information down the road is gonna be potentially be an indicator of an impediment or show us where we might have issues installing treatments or changing the, the geometrics or something like that. So this is just some things to consider is alignment, um, proportional representation, uh, pavement and lane width. Um, if you have overhead clearance issues, that's always a good thing to probably document. Um, you know, what are the speed limits? Always important. Uh, landscaping is a good one. Um, the, the key here is where appropriate. We don't need to document every single tree that's caught in this aerial image. Um, signing, always important. Signing and low cost improvements like that are always good to note what's out there since it's the, the fastest way to get a potential treatment out into the field. Um, other things like guardrail um, and then typical sections is always one where um, if it's important and there is an option to change that cross section of the roadway, definitely good to document what's out there. You'll notice that this existing condition or this physical condition diagram is over an aerial image. Um, that's definitely a really helpful way to present this. So when we go into a field visit or when we're trying to pass this on again, five, six years down the road, people can look at this and have that aerial image to kind of show exactly what was happening at the time the study was completed. So again, this is just showing a different example of what are we, what do we need to capture out here in terms of, of excuse me, of existing conditions. So this is more or less a figure. We're not quite doing the, the full diagram, um, but you can see that we have some, some interesting geometry to say the least here. And so capturing the, the the distance and the angles between this intersection layout was particularly important for this study. And so we, we've come up with another figure just to highlight um, the way that this intersection, or I should say these intersections are, are laid out for the study. So another example of our existing conditions, you'll see um, a bit more of a rural setting, um, but we have uh, the aerial image in the background kind of grayed out, big emphasis on signs and signals here. Um, we have uh, less information, I would say, on right away or utilities, but um, definitely trying to capture the most important information to orient the user or the, the viewer, I should say, to where we're at and what, what's going on with particularly the signing and the signalization here. If um, you're unsure about what documents to include in your, your physical conditions diagram, this is another great time to have that conversation with the DSRT and with your locals, uh, authorities to, to really understand what are the issues that are impacting safety and what issues are potentially impacting future um, upgrades and treatment installations. And then again, including typical sections, um, these are definitely more of a, of a figure base that we, we want to shy away from, you know, going too far overboard in terms of uh, a design document type um, exhibits, but definitely something to help show potentially the spacing of vehicles or roadside hazards or anything like that.
All right, so in terms of collecting, uh, collecting existing data, um, big things here are what data is currently available that we can use as a basis or we can verify in the field. Um, conducting a field visit is, you know, usually it can be a really helpful uh, way to make sure your, your desktop data, so to speak, is up to date. Um, having that conversation at the scoping meeting of do we anticipate needing that field review is definitely helpful. But um, Cindy alluded to the, the trans transportation information mapping system yesterday, TIMS. Um, TIMS is an excellent resource and one that you know we use daily here in our office um, to help serve as that base for what data do we currently have. Um, if we're working on state system roads, we might have a lot of up-to-date, accurate information right at our fingertips. So before we even get out into the field, we can have a good sense of what we're looking at. So I'm going to do a quick run through uh, TIMS, kind of as it relates to background data collection. Um, so this is the TIMS landing page. This is accessible from multiple points throughout ODOT's website. Um, and you'll see when we land here, we've got a couple options. We can look up past projects if you've never done this. We can just create a map. We can download map data, crash data. Um, there's a couple different map viewers. And then we'll hit on a little bit later is the crash data search. But for right now, we'll just go to create a map. All right. And then zoom in just a little bit so we get a better idea. So this is uh, the, the Cleveland area. And you'll see here on the left-hand side of the screen, we have a lot of options for different layers that we can turn on. So in terms of assets, you know, a lot of information for various types of ODOT and general transportation assets. Um, certainly not going to go through all of these. I'd encourage you to take some time and read through the available data um, on Tim's data glossary. Um, the real things that I want to point us to are the roadway information. Um, you'll note we do have traffic count segments, which if I can just zoom in a little bit here. So our traffic count segments, you'll notice we're, we're highlighting a fair number of roads. These are generally our state roads are all covered um, and they're color coded. And as we zoom in more, we'll actually see uh, some traffic count data that is applied to the roads. We can also bring up the stations in terms of where these counts are coming from. If we click the identify feature information, we can click on one of these blue dots and we can actually bring up the traffic collection report. This is a really great tool. Um, even if we know we're gonna be conducting a, uh, a traffic volume count um, in the nearby area, this can kind of help us quickly assess, you know, is traffic in the region generally growing at a fast rate? Um, what's the changes like year over year? I know we're using this frequently right now to tell us, okay, if we have 2020 data versus 2019, if we got counts in both, what's the change looking like um, because of COVID and the impacts of COVID? So if we do a data collection as a, as a part of a, a safety study, we can go back and see how much deviation is there from the past trends of 19, 18, 17, et cetera. So that information is all in here. Um, likewise, so we can go back to our visible layers. I'll turn these off for simplicity. Um, we can go to the roadway inventory layer. And you'll see again, um, county routes, state routes, our higher functional class routes. This is a pretty suburban area that we zoomed into here. Um, but so there's not a lot of data on our local roads, but if we click on, let's say state route 82, um, we do have a lot of information in terms of, um, excuse me, in terms of what's the functional classification, number of lanes, it, what's the median type? Um, and so if you're familiar looking at this data or you want to start to, you can, we can get a pretty good idea of what the conditions are going to be just at a high level. Alternatively, um, everyone should be really familiar with using Google. Google Street View and uh, Google Maps is a really excellent way to get a feel for your site before you go into the field. Um, the one caution on all of this data would be um, either it's make sure you're, you're field verifying it or make sure that um, somebody has field verified that, you know, the Google Street View on this section has been up to date. You know, the, the county engineer just took a look at their route last last month and uh, it's it's spot on. 
So we want to just be careful that we're using up-to-date information. So we're not making any of our assessments based on outdated um, GIS or aerial or street view imagery. So TIMS can do an awful lot. Um, there's a lot of great data available to users here. Um, again, just kind of showing a brief overview at this point, but uh, highly encourage everyone to go to TIMS and kind of sort out the data that they might need. Excuse me. All right, so the next type of data that after we get through existing conditions that we're really gonna start looking through is crash data. Um, and crash reports from the field uh, collected by officers are our basis for crash data. At a minimum, you know, we wanna collect year crash types, crash severities, crash locations, um, what were the road conditions, what were the lighting conditions, and uh, lastly, um, an NLF ID and or log point or sorry, NLF ID and log point or location ID. Um, so this is some pretty basic information. Uh, quickly, NLF ID is ODOT system for uniquely, sorry, for unique identification for a roadway. It applies to all roads, either on or off the ODOT system. So local roads all have an NLF ID as well. Um, and this will carry through to crash reports and other pertinent information. Um, all of our records and TIMS that we were just looking at all of the roadways have um, NLF IDs associated with the segments. So um, you can see that the, the scheme for determining the NLF ID, or the key I should say, is uh, color coded here. So first is the letter out front is gonna be jurisdiction. So state, county, township, or municipality. Um, note that jurisdiction is not necessarily maintenance authority. Um, it's what uh, what is the, the ownership or jurisdiction of the roadway. So we can very well have a state route going through a city um, that will still be labeled as a state route and not municipal. Uh, the next three characters in yellow here are the county abbreviation, uh, followed by a two letter route type. Uh, the next five characters are the route number. You'll see this, the this first star or asterisk uh, in red is a route number extension. Um, this only applies to select roads. Uh, same thing with the route type is uh, a second asterisk. And then finally, uh, cardinal and non-cardinal direction um, helps us identify inventory of the roadway, particularly where roadways are divided. So um, don't be confused or shocked if we pull up the crash reports and you see asterisks in there and mixes of letters and numbers. Um, I'll spend a little bit of time working through these and it becomes pretty natural to understand kind of what the NLF ID is telling you. So in terms of collecting crash data and kind of working with crash data, um, it is available from more than one location. And I think that's important to understand. Um, uh, TIMS, as I pointed out earlier, has a, a crash search a GCAT application that we can pull crash data from. It's an excellent resource to quickly get um, really useful data in our hands. Um, but the Ohio Department of Public Safety, ODPS, is uh, a, a is technically the steward for crash data in the state. So we can pull crash data directly from ODPS. And lastly, um, there might be a local crash database to work with. I know um, particularly when we get off the ODOT system, um, there are situations where it's always good to double check, um, even when we pull the crash data from TIMS to double check with our county and local partners. Um, is the, are these the numbers that you have on file or do you have additional crashes that were not reported to DPS and aren't in ODOT's database? Um, so always important to verify throughout the process that we're working with the most up-to-date data. Um, one thing that Cindy mentioned a lot yesterday and you'll see is, is still ringing true today is having the conversations continuously. It's, it's not um, have a kickoff meeting, have a scoping meeting, and then we'll talk to you in four months with a completed study. This really is a lot of touch points and a lot of process of working together with you know, DSRT, with local partners. Um, in terms of analyzing and working with our crash data, we're gonna go through an example of working with ODOT's CAM tool. Um, it's an excellent resource that makes life um, significantly easier for us here in Ohio. Um, and then the last thing is the, the crash report forms themselves. Um, crashes used to are all filled out on Ohio's OH1 report. Um, each detailed report can be pulled from TIMS and GCAT, and really the CAM tool too, we'll see there's an option to pull the report. And the reason why we wanna become familiar with looking at the reports is while we get these great 
uh, tables and tables of data. Um, there are times that we want to make sure that what is captured in the report and in the, the tables that are summarized in the report is accurate of what really happened. And we'll go through a few examples of that here in a bit. So if we pull crash data, um, generically speaking, you'll see we get a lot of, a lot of fields. Um, just like our physical conditions, we can really pull a lot of information and start going down a lot of different alleys and avenues in terms of how we want to break up this data. Um, this tabular data, uh, what we have in front of us is actually, it's, it's kind of clipped. This is all the same five reports. Um, and so normally in the Excel file that we would get this in, these would all, all of these images would be next to each other. But you can see we have a lot of information between um, the accident report number, our local report number, see the NLF ID here in terms of, uh, it's, a, it's our same example from before. We have the, the mile point number where the crash occurred. Um, and then a lot of other information as we start kind of pouring through this, um, lighting conditions, you know, what was the severity of the crash overall? Uh, what were the road conditions? So a lot of data that we can really work through here. And this is great that we get it all in um, this tabular format, because if we just had OH1 traffic record reports or traffic crash reports, um, we'd have to go through each one of these reports, which can be, you know, multiple, multiple pages if it's a large crash. Um, and so it's really great that we have uh, kind of both options available to us here in Ohio. OH1 crash reports are filled out at the scene or for low severity crashes in select jurisdictions um, at a police station after the crash has occurred. Um, and uh, historically, these are, these are literally pads of paper that are filled out um, and then submitted to uh, ODPS. Um, now, ODPS has been transitioning, uh, and I think they're almost fully transitioned to electronic reporting. So these are uploaded digitally. Um, that's great. It's an excellent enhancement too, because um, now everything as we pull these reports is, uh, we, we have no longer have to deal with handwriting, which sometimes can be an issue. But the, the OH1 report as you start to review them are, are really important. Yes, we have the big nitty gritty pictures of you know all of our crashes at once through the tables, but looking through OH1 reports helps us fill in that little bit of gap. And the, the, the biggest thing that we want to review is going to be right here on the front page. Let me, there we go. So these sections of the report with the narrative and the diagram really help to fill in uh, the numbers and the letters that are captured in the rest of these forms. Uh, the numbers and letters that are captured in these forms are what eventually become the the attributes listed in the table, but the narrative helps to fill in that background for us. Um, particularly if you're dealing with, um, you know, a non-highway site, or if you're dealing with a local site, it really helps to read through just, I mean, we, re we read through every crash report when we're doing safety studies. Um, that's a good chance to kind of understand what occurred on these crashes, helps us to verify that these crashes are, are valid and are pertaining to a, a safety condition and not some other extenuating circumstances. Um, but then it's also the best chance we have to really wrap our head around our site. So looking through a few OH1 examples, um, this is a typical narrative. You can see uh, over the years, the actual physical layout has changed a little bit, but it stays pretty much the same. So looking through this example, we can see unit one pulled into certified gas at 100 West Lincoln Way and hit a post that protects the pumps. Unit one then hit the gas pedal and drove right into the roadway, stopping in a line of traffic. Um, unit one then backed out of traffic onto the lot of certified, hitting the right rear bed side of unit number two. So there's a lot going on here. Um, but if this crash ends up in our, our study as we're pulling the information from Market and Lincoln Way here, um, the big thing is this crash actually occurred on private property. So um, we wanna take that into mind. And if we're analyzing the performance of this intersection, this is a crash that we would not wanna include. Um, we would also probably wanna review any other extenuating circumstances that caused vehicle one to act kind of erratically. Um, always good to know. So this is another example from an OH1. Um, unit one was traveling northbound on State Route 31 between US 33 
and Mill Road. Unit 2 was traveling northbound on State Route 31 and attempted to make a U-turn in the same area. Unit 1 struck the rear side of Unit 2. Um, so a couple important things here. Um, this crash is still valid, depending on what our study site looks like. Um, but if we're seeing in these narratives a lot of the, the pre, a lot of U-turns in this area, that might indicate a greater operational need at the site. That's not something we're necessarily going to see in a chart or a figure or a table, but by reading the, the narratives, we get a feel for maybe we do need to do something in terms of um, access management or allowing for a valid U-turn, or there's something more to consider there. The other thing to note is this crash was labeled at an intersection, um, but is this actually related to this intersection? Um, and you know, without reading more into this report, I'm not going to say one way or another, but it's it is good to know, um, particularly the particularly at intersections, it's good to know, you know, if it occurred near a specific intersection type, it may not actually be related. The, the crash itself may not be related to the operation and safety concern of that intersection. Um, and we really find that out by looking through the narratives and uh, really thinking through things from a, a little bit more of a, a qualitative perspective rather than a quantitative. All right, so last one here. Um, unit one was passing a line of stop traffic left of center and unit two turned left being struck by unit one. Unit one was responding to a fire with, um, to a fire call with no lights or sirens. So in this case, unit one is um, an emergency vehicle responding to a fire. Um, and unit two uh, uh, turned into, sorry, yeah, unit two turned left and then was struck by unit one that was trying to pass him. So this is an emergency vehicle and not this situation is not related to normal operations at this segment, this site or this intersection. Um, so it's important that we read through there to understand that this is probably not a crash that we want to retain in terms of our study, just because this doesn't capture a normal operation condition. Um, now, if we have several of these crashes occurring, um, that's another conversation that we would likely have to have about what's going on here and how can we mitigate these particular crash types. Another thing to note is this diagram. Uh, you can see we have a lot of cars stacked up here before we get to vehicles one and two. Um, this might be an indication that we have a queuing issue, and this might trigger um, that we need to do a capacity study or something, or a traffic operations or signal timing study um, in addition to um, just the basic safety study. So another time where we're not quite at identifying the, the additional needed studies, but by reviewing these crash reports, we get a better idea of what's happening. All right, so real quick, I'm gonna go through uh, the GCAT application of how we're gonna collect this app, this crash data. So um, it, on the TIMS landing page, uh, we get back to our first page here and we'll go to crash data search. One thing to note is um, to do a, a full crash data search, you do need to log in. Um, I am already logged in, otherwise it kind of pops up and says, please log in. Um, information on how to get your GCAT login or your GCAT access is available through ODOT's highway safety, uh, highway safety page. This is the highway safety page that Cindy showed yesterday. If we go down to crash trends and resources, we land on this particular landing page. Um, then to get to all of our analysis tools and background documentation, we're gonna hit the launch button in the top right-hand corner. And you'll see that brings us to kind of a treasure trove of different ODOT um, uh, manuals, documents, uh, tools, everything that we're gonna talk about in, in this course between uh, our GCAT access documents, the CAM tool that we'll go over here in a little bit, and the ECAT tool, economic crash analysis, that we'll cover uh, next week in depth. Right. So to get your, once you're logged in, um, you'll hit the welcome screen. Uh, we have a few filters here that we can really work through to get the specific information that we need. Uh, yesterday, Cindy had mentioned we, when we're doing safety studies, we specifically want to look at a minimum of three, possibly as much as five years of crash data. It's another thing that we want to discuss in the, the scoping meeting before we 
you really dive into the analysis is, you know, what does district feels appropriate? What do our local partners think is appropriate? So to select the specific years, we simply just click on them. Couldn't be easier. We have the option to pick specific months. If we know every February we see a giant spike in crashes and we want to dive into that, we can filter those out now, or we can leave it blank and we will get all months of the year. Similarly, we can work through specific filters for crash types, for the SHSP emphasis area, for drivers and vehicles, um, and then the last one here is for location. So the location one is really important. Um, typically speaking, we don't want to start by pulling all of the data in the state of Ohio for a time period. Um, the way to you could you the way that you pull data at this screen is really dependent on how particular you're trying to get. So um, we can pull based off of a specific NLF ID and mile points. Um, we can enter a city or a village, an ODOT township, an entire county, um, uh, or if we want to get some combination of those, you know, we could do. Um, T intersections within a specific county, so Adams. So we could pull that really up to whatever you're looking for. For this example, I'm just going to go with North Royalton. All right, so we have three years of data for North Royalton. We can do one of two things. We can view it in a map or directly download. Um, if you view it in a map, you can download on the next screen, which is nice and easy. So the next thing that pops up is your selection yielded 1,443 results. Um, one point to notice, if we're trying to pull a lot of years for a large area, there is a limit. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. I believe it's over 100,000 crashes. Um, we'll start running into a limit where we have to refine our selection. So you may have to pull, um, if you're really looking to pull a lot of crash data all at once, it might take a few different queries. That being said, for safety studies, we're generally dealing with very specific points or locations or corridors, um, and so it's usually not a problem. In this case, we're pulling three years of data for a suburban city outside of Cleveland, and you can see we're well below um, any sort of a limit. All right. So you'll see it takes a second or two to think through things, and then we have a whole lot of dots pop up. If we zoom in just a little bit. We can see each of these dots represents a crash. Um, they are color-coded based on severity. Um, our blue dots are property damage only crashes, with red being uh, our fat fatal crashes or fat fatalities involved. Um, but we can see, generally speaking, that this is all the crashes listed as North Royalton. Um, Kind of an important thing and why I like this example is um, we have here, this this road here is actually the turnpike, this is I-80, and it extends well outside of North Royalton. Um, but because of access and uh, where the reporting goes, these crashes are listed within the city of North Royalton. Now, if we were doing a citywide analysis, this is important to understand that we need to you know, verify what we're looking at before we select everything. But again, for a safety study, we'll generally have an understanding of what roads that we're looking at. Um, and what locations, because one of the first things that we did, if you remember, was we defined the extent and the, the study limits um, that we're looking for. All right, so um, for simplicity's sake, I'm gonna just zoom in on an intersection here. And now you'll see, as we get closer, uh, far less dots, we have our aerial imagery. If we were looking, um, you know, if we were familiar with this site, we might know, hey, we're studying this intersection but we want to include crashes that may be related to the intersection. Um, so this is a good case where these crashes are pretty far away from it. You know, um, we do eventually have a turn lane up here, but this one almost happens before that taper even begins. Um, general rule of thumb is include it in your crash pool and then review that crash. See if it was related to a queue being backed up or something like that. Um, you know, an additional crash or two is not necessarily a huge deal. Um, but what we want to do is if this isn't related to the intersection, we eventually are going to want to exclude that from our analysis. 
So to actually select crashes, um, we have a few options here. We can select by the graphic type, points, circles, lines, polygons. Um, I find the easiest is to usually just do a polygon and then we hit draw. And then we're going to select, you can see this red line kind of comes up. And so we just start drawing a box around the crashes that we want. And then to finish the polygon, we just double click. So this is the search area that we're going to pull. Everything that's within this red box, once we hit search, will become selected. So now you can see that all those dots are kind of a light blue indicating that we've selected them. And then something else to point out that's important is down here at the bottom of the screen, um, these are our different results. Um, we can look through them here, but uh, it's probably better just to acknowledge that they're here. We have 16 crashes here. If we actually count up these dots, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, you'll see that we only have 10 dots that we can see. Definitely the importance of selecting your crashes before you start doing any analysis in your head. Um, these are plotted by latitude and longitude points. And so, you know, it might just be common for an officer responding to this scene to report the center of the intersection. Um, and so we might have dots that are perfectly on top of each other. That doesn't necessarily mean that's 100% where they are, um, but it's something that we will verify when we review those narratives and crash diagrams for the reports. So once these are selected, uh, we have the option to export these, these data. The four options are to Excel, to a KMZ or KML, which this is a Google Earth file for anyone that's not familiar. We can put it into a shape file or to a geo database. So lots of options in terms of getting to an Excel platform to analyze the data or kind of a GIS or spatial analysis. If we clicked Excel, this is the best way to kind of get it into that CAM tool, which we'll go over here in a minute. You'll see that the uh, there's a spinning wheel more or less that pops up under the, the download button. Once that's done spinning, then we hit download and the data is now downloaded to our file. So that's one quick example of how we can download data through TIMS and the GCAT tool. So uh, we will pick up with that example here in just a minute. But for right now, we're gonna get back to kind of what are we gonna do with that data once we download it? So um, the most important thing is we're, we're, we wanna focus on summarizing this crash data. We don't wanna present each individual crash, obviously one for one, but what's important to present and what's important to, to summarize. We don't wanna load our safety study full of every single chart that we can possibly make. We wanna cover the pertinent information. So, um, and we wanna cover kind of what the, the safety problem is. Um, typical things we wanna cover are the types of crashes, severity, um, is there a time of day factor? Um, any particularly interesting contributing circumstances? If we're seeing trends of, you know, um, of our 16 crashes, if nine or let's say if 12 of them are alcohol related, that's an interesting circumstance um, that we'll wanna definitely partner up with uh, some of our other safety stakeholders with. Um, and are there any environmental conditions? So if we have a, an eastbound, intersection leg and we're seeing a lot of crashes in the early morning, um, perhaps there's a glare issue there that we need to address. So this is kind of an example of the different ways that we can show data. You know, we can put it in graphs and charts or in histograms. Um, there, there's not necessarily a right or a wrong way to do this. I think the, the biggest thing is we want to, um, we want to be sure that we are, again, not overloading the study with every single chart we can make. Um, for instance, uh, we have this we have this wet weather chart right here, uh, or crashes by weather condition, I should say. Um, this doesn't tell us anything, so let's not include charts like this just for the sake of having made them. All right, so this is uh, an example that I want to walk through quickly of kind of how the crash data analysis was uh, summarized for a very large study. This is Interstate 270 um, from State Route 161 to 670. You'll see that we have a lot of summary information by crashes by year, by month, um, road conditions. So we have this overall diagram that's really great. And we've plotted the individual crash points um, with some sections called out. This ends up being a, a one-page summary that ends up including a lot of information. So we have 
uh, a summary box. This is, uh, it's a little bit hard to see, so we're gonna blow up some parts of this, but we have a summary box kind of in narrative format um, describing the crash patterns and trends. If we, if we look a little bit further, we're talking about where the project area would be. Um, and so we have specific things called out. So project prohibited westbound state route 161 traffic from exiting at Morse Road. Um, and then we can see, you know, is that impacting our crashes? Um, and then the next thing down here is we can see another portion about what were the impacts of our of this construction project. Um, again, this is a post-construction analysis for a large, large highway project. The other thing to kind of point out here is we've selected specific crashes as they're pertinent to the study. We didn't fill in every crash on every side road here, but this intersection you'll notice off to the right-hand side of the screen, um, we did populate these crashes because there's likely um, the increase in crashes, which is plus 22, is likely due to the increase in traffic volume related to the development. And so this is a situation of showing appropriate crash data, but not overloading with everything we can show. All right, so in terms of um, other things that we wanna do, uh, the CAMT was really the basis for in Ohio for looking at charts and figures. But one thing that we want to consider is how is this report and this safety study going to be used? Um, and so I think one way that I've always tried to do it is if we if we could only capture a few snapshots of crashes, what are the, the key bullets and the key points that we could use in a public outreach meeting or that we can quickly have somebody scan through along with maybe a crash diagram or a physical conditions diagram um, to really summarize the safety issues. So um, here's one example of kind of the text, summary text of, of crashes. Um, these are a little on the longer side. They're definitely, definitely well done, um, but we're dealing with a lot of crashes here. I think uh, as I turn the page, this next example is really, um, really a great example of how to quickly summarize the issues. So this is the noteworthy crash patterns within uh, an intersection influence area. And so we specifically call out what are driveway access related crashes. You know, 30 of the right angle crashes, eight were on the north leg of Reynolds Road, and 19 occurred at the east leg of Airport Highway. Um, and so what we're doing here is we're specifically calling out specific crash types and locations um, that are popping up in the crash data. It's quick narrative that we can use in a lot of different ways, but specifically, if somebody's gonna read through the safety study and we've included this list, um, you know, not that we would encourage anyone to skim read our work, but if they happen to, because, you know, we've passed this off to somebody outside of the realm of, of engineering or planning, um, we're making sure that they're getting the pertinent information. So outside of using text, um, you know, don't feel limited by just the charts and tables in the CAM tool or just by text. You know, if you have creative ways of presenting this information, um, whatever helps get the, the point across in terms of the, the need for a safety improvement um, and is still within the realms of, you know, summarizing data. We don't want to create more work in terms of trying to figure out what a graphic is telling us. But these are two different examples of how we can summarize some different crash data. So this example that I'm not really going to go through um, is kind of a, a hybrid. We have a collision diagram in here with some of the the, the crash symbols, um, but then we've also called out some of those pertinent locations um, in more of a narrative format. And we actually have information in here that helps us to understand why people may or may not be turning or why crashes may or may not have incurred, uh, improved, excuse me, um, increased over the study period. All right, so quickly gonna run through the CAM tool that we've talked about a couple times. So um, the CAM tool for the record can be downloaded if we go back to TIMS. It can be downloaded in two different places. In our TIMS data, this is where we pulled our 16 crashes in the city of North Royalton. Um, on the left-hand side of the screen here, we'll see uh, the last symbol at the top of this pane is the crash analytics tool. It's a, it's a roadway symbol. And if we scroll down, we can click CAM tool. And then the CAM tool will download directly to uh, your, your downloaded files. The other location is on the crash analysis tools, as I mentioned before. Um, this is where, where the GCAT access training was. You'll see we can download the CAM tool and a CAM tool help file here um, as well. So 
I'm going to run through kind of how to populate a CAM tool. Um, to say completed CAM tool. All right, so um, when we open up the CAM tool, this is really important is some content is by default disabled by um, Excel. The CAM tool runs on macros, so you need to enable those macros or enable the content for it to work. Um, big thing is we don't really wanna change too much in terms of columns or layouts or anything, particularly on this page, because we need to make sure that the format is correct so the tool can run properly. So we, we open up the toolbox, hitting the button in the top left-hand corner of the, of the first page. This is the toolbar that pops up. Uh, the TIMS or GCAT import, this .csv or .xls, this is the file that we downloaded um, from the TIMS application. Um, when we hit the download to Excel, this is the format that we're looking for. So if we click on this button, it'll ask us to find that file. So this is the filtered crash events that we had. Uh, this is one that I had from before, so apologies if it's slightly different. And so you can see after we hit that, the data is now filled in. Um, and that's all that's really changed at this point is we've imported our data. You'll notice we have these tabs on the bottom for crash analysis, unit analysis, emphasis areas, proportions, and crash tree. Um, none of this information is updated just on the import. So the next step that we want to do is go back to our toolbox and up top we have this analysis tab is the second one we want to click the top run button and then all of our charts will update um, it happens really quick um, part of that is i have a very small file but again for safety studies we're generally dealing with uh, discrete areas and so cam tool is usually nice and quick for us so you see as we look through here there's a lot of crash data that's populated in tables and various um, charts. The nice thing about these is the data is all here for you. We can then format any way that we want um, to get it to match our report nicely. Um, also, if anybody, hopefully people are familiar with using pivot tables, but that's how data is stored in the new CAM tool, which is really great. So I can copy and paste this CAM tool and then kind of work through any other chart that I want to see. So even if the chart as you see it isn't exactly um, kind of what you were hoping for. Um, it's really easy to find the, the right chart or the right table and get, you know, where you want to go for your, your safety study. So um, there's a lot of other charts available as you kind of work through this. Um, definitely encourage everyone to kind of do a quick example CAM tool. Um, should be nice and easy for you. There's also some options to work in um, crash trees and uh, work through comparative proportional tables. Um, these are some of the newer features in the update of the CAM tool. If you've, if you've previously used the CAM tool a few years ago, this will probably look different. ODOT's gone, uh, gone, through, gone ahead and updated several features. Um, so encourage everyone to kind of play around with the data and see how these different, um, these new tools kind of help supplement any studies that you're doing. Last point is if you are used to the old CAM tool, you can still, on the analysis tab, you can still go ahead and populate the legacy crash data, or um, you can populate an, a collision diagram in, uh, in the CAM tool itself. But for the sake of time, um, I'm going to kind of move on to introducing the collision tools before we try to run one. All right, so a collision diagram, like a physical uh, conditions diagram or an existing conditions diagram is, a, um, is one way to quickly and effectively capture what's going on at my site or location. Um, they're schematic and not necessarily represented or not necessarily meant to show each individual's exact location. If we did that, we would have a lot of overlapping symbols and be hard to read. We're just trying to capture general themes of where crashes are occurring. Um, so it's graphical representations of individual crashes, and that's important. Um, so we're actually going to try to capture each individual crash on the collision diagram. Again, really useful in providing a pictorial summary of the crashes. Um, it's the easiest way to hand somebody a, one piece of paper and say, this is what's going on with crashes in the last three years at our location. Um, again, we want to focus on being careful of 
the length being to scale, um, we may need to exaggerate the horizontal scale a little bit in, if we need to show more detail. And then crashes should be placed in a lane in which they occur if the information is available. And likewise, we'll touch on this in a second. We wanna make sure that the crash symbols that we're using are indicating the correct story. We'll touch on that in a minute. So this is, again, we wanna uh, review the crash reports to really help us understand where this specific crash report, or excuse me, where this specific crash took place. Um, as you saw, uh, the, the, the tabular data that we get um, has a lot of descriptions for where the crash took place, but going back to that OH1 has a map of, hey, this is exactly where the collision happened. Um, and then the information that we associate with each individual crash uh, might vary based on the, the the preliminary cam tool that you put together, you know, you may decide that, hey, we've got a lot of crashes occurring kind of at dusk, dawn. Um, so maybe we need to include lighting condition or we're having a lot of winter crashes. So we need roadway condition. Um, at a minimum, you generally want to include what the type of crash was, absolutely. Um, when the crash occurred, um, lighting conditions may happen. Definitely want to include severity. Um, and you definitely want to make sure that this is, you know, not just an image in in a, a larger study, but this really needs to be a standalone diagram. So we want legends, title boxes. Um, this really should be its its own standalone um, product at the end. So a few examples of collision diagrams. Um, you'll notice here that we have our oversight background images again. So using aerial imagery is again, a great way to make this not just an engineering tool or an analysis tool, but really a, a public engagement tool at some level. Uh, you'll see how we have a uh, legend, North Arrow. Um, we've kind of showed where, where the intersection is and what's happening. And then we're specifically highlighting two areas um, to denote individual crash, crash information. Earlier when I had mentioned that we want to make sure that the symbols are showing, you know, an accurate display of the, the crashes that are occurring. Um, these are angle type crashes. If we look back at our um, legend up top and back here, we have rear end crashes. Um, you'll see that they're actually in the correct, correct direction of travel. Um, they're, they're aligned properly with the, the roadway center lines. Um, this is at a schematic level, an example of how the crash actually occurred. You know, we don't have our rear end crashes just going straight up and down because this is, you know, more or less the north leg or, or west leg as it were. Um, so we're trying to make sure that when I look at this, I'm getting an accurate representation of how the crash occurred. Um, and again, that's not uh, necessarily exactly how it occurred, but um, we want to make sure that somebody's not getting misinformation from these sort of things. All right. So here's another example. Um, you can see we've included uh, stop signs or and signalization as appropriate. Um, we're a little bit more summary in how we are identifying some of the crashes. So we have four different crashes here that are all occurred at this location. They were all rear end crashes. Um, and so we have the date, we have the time, and we have uh, the, the roadway condition in text all for one symbol. So that's another way to kind of save on space because um, some may get very crowded if we had, you know, five different or four different individual lines here. It'd be hard to get them to really show accurately. And then just one last example here um, on our collision diagram. Uh, again, still using aerial imagery. Um, you'll see this one is not necessarily straight up and down, but we're, we're able to, to make the collision diagram work and be effective with the aerial imagery that we have available. This has a really good legend in it, um, really easy to kind of reference my crash type, what are the symbols, um, and then we actually have, uh, as, as we would need, we have code conversions more or less between our weather condition, road condition, and severity. You'll also notice here that severity, um, oops, sorry, um, in this case, the color coding of the crashes has to do with specific years, so is one way that we're able to call to mind, you know, we're seeing a lot of red here and only a little green. Um, so maybe we've done something since 2007 to mitigate the number of crashes. In other cases, the colors might refer to severity. So definitely important to have a legend that's accurate and up to date. Um, and this is usually a good one to pass around to a few different people to make sure nobody misinterprets it. Um, just because we've put something together that we feel is awesome, um, definitely wanna make sure that DSRT and local group can quickly and easily um, 
understand what they're looking at. These are the figures that will typically get presented at public meetings after we hand off our safety study, or that if we need to go to council to get buy-in, this is something that folks usually want to turn over um, and show. So definitely want to make sure that um, it's as clear as it can be. All right. So the last thing that I want to touch on um, in terms of data collection is supplemental data. When we're talking about supplemental data, um, we that's kind of a vague term. Um, typically, what we want to do is talk about supplemental data within the context of a field review. So when we go out and we look at stuff in the field, um, we want to just keep our eyes open and look at things um, such as skid marks on pavement, usually an indication of, you know, do we have a turning problem or a stopping problem or a visual or sight distance problem? Um, are there tire tracks or excessive wear on the roadway shoulder? Is there a damaged guardrail uh, hit, uh, hit bushes, et cetera? Um, are there lots of broken glass or chrome strips or other vehicle debris? And does that, does the locations of that um, coincide with our crash data? Um, are utility poles or trees look like they've been struck? Um, or does it look like there is, is wear to the curb below them? Um, anything like this where uh, we might get a better idea of, you know, possibly there's underreported crashes, property damage only crashes where folks may not want to um, deal with the headaches of filling out a report or insurance. So um, they'll just drive off. Um, fence strikes is one that we dealt with uh, recently where folks are uh, we're departing the roadway and striking the fence and the, the crash data sure didn't show it, but the fence was pretty beat up. And we actually, um, the owners of the fence was a, a larger group and we were able to get their records of how often they've had to repair that fence. So that's a great use of supplemental data. So we really understood that our roadway departure crashes were much higher than we initially thought. Um, the last thing here, I'm sorry, there's a bit of a, a text crash at the bottom, but in yellow, we say document and photograph. Um, usually a good idea to, if we have significant issues like this, put them into your existing conditions diagram and include photographs of these things in the safety study report. Um, these are the things that we want to make sure that we are documenting now. Um, so A, we can see, you know, have we mitigated any of these, these situations or, you know, are we still dealing with these problems in the future when we go back and revisit this? Alrighty. Um, so... That's the, the background data collection section of today's presentation. Um, after this, we're really going to go into um, applying the Part C methodology that Cindy described yesterday. But before I do that, um, Cindy, Mike, do we have any questions that we want to kind of throw out to the group? I see there's some, some questions coming through here and there. Yeah, um, I think I would just touch on uh, the two questions that have come out so that there's some clarification. Um, the first question had to do with um, when there's a situation that has uh, numerous potential, potentially uh, alcohol-related crashes and what to do with those crashes, and should they be ex excluded from the analysis? Um, the, the general response is yes, we typically exclude alcohol-related crashes, but there's a however or, or a but. Um, there are situations, though, where we still want to consider um, the information from the crash report. So all crash reports should definitely be reviewed and we need to determine, you know, are there anything, are there any other um, things that we need to note related to, um, you know, what happened during the crash, even though someone was impaired, um, what they struck, um, what happened potentially, uh, you know, to either make them leave the roadway or, or whatever, you know, contributed to, to, to the crash in case that's something that we need to be aware of. Um, but when we would do our analysis in ECAT, we would typically take those out. However, in an isolated situation where there's one crash, that's pretty easy to do. But when there's multiple, um, that's telling us something else. That's telling us that, hey, we've got maybe a, a different and a bigger issue here. Um, and we probably need to stop and think about it for a second. So if you have a situation where you have multiple, that's when you probably want to loop in your district coordinator. Maybe there's a nearby bar. Um, something is going on, you know, that's telling us, hey, we've got a situation here where we maybe need to get somebody besides just ODOT involved, and ODOT would be the folks that would do that, but maybe law enforcement or someone else needs to be ma made aware of this location. Because that's one of the things that sometimes we um, don't think about is that ODOT has all this power and, um, you know, manpower to do these types of analyses that sometimes um, other agencies don't, and so they may not be aware 
of a situation, particularly when it comes to alcohol and impairment in that method or that manner. Um, you know, if they've got a, a hotspot location, you know, associated with some particular establishment or groups of establishments, they may not know that. They probably do, but they may not know that. And so this is information that ODOT would probably want to pass on uh, to those, those folks. Um, and then the second one had to do with, is the CAM tool proprietary? I mean, I think I can speak, I'm, I'm pretty sure, and can say that it's not proprietary. However, um, we recommend, you know, that anybody who's interested in developing something for their own use outside of Ohio, that they reach out to central office, Derek in particular, um, so that, um, you know, he could talk through how the tool itself was developed and um, if it's something that could be converted easily to, to, for use in another state or, or what would need to be done. I think ODOT is pretty open and responsive um, in, in terms of sharing the type of work that they do and, and the things that they've developed um, because they want, you know, they, everybody's doing this in the best interest of, of reducing crashes. So in that case, if you're interested in using this tool elsewhere, I don't think that's an issue, but I would definitely recommend talking to Derek um, about that before you do. That's all we have right now. Great, thanks, Cindy. And I guess the the last thing on the CAM tool there is um, it was developed for use with Ohio crash data specifically, um, and so um, that may be one of the barriers that that gets outlined initially is it is heavily based on ODOT's and ODPS's crash data yes. format. Yes, exactly. Not to say that it couldn't be modified to deal with whatever format your state may develop or may produce, and that's why it's really important to talk to Derek about it, and he can communicate that to you and 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 help you through that if this is something that you know you decided you wanted to try in your state. Yeah, so I'll add since I'm paying attention today. There you are. Hey. Today. Yes. <laughs> uh, so not kind of along the lines of, of Alex's, it's not proprietary, but it's so customized that it's hard to take and pick up and take to a state. Um, the, the thought process and the methodologies behind it is, is really beneficial to other states at times. Um, and then um, I'm, I'm gladly give it to any state for free that then they can use with other projects to customize it or meet their data needs. Um, kind of the same, along the same lines as our um, ECAT tool, which I think is next week's demonstration. So happy to share tools with other states um, and, and have them develop on top of that that meets their needs. Um, and then I think the other thing to add to the first question about alcohol related crashes, there's no um, downfall to adding that summary to a safety study, even if like our safety study is really engineering focused. Um, county engineers are highly ingrained in the system, um, work with sheriffs often. So if something like that comes up, um, just putting it in there is another discussion point that they can reach out to a different kind of agency. So we don't often see that added to um, studies, but I, I think it's if it's noted, go ahead and add it, um, um, that it's a trend that could be alarming. Excellent, thanks Derek and thanks Cindy. Alrighty, so we're gonna move on to confirm or identify potential for site safety improvements. And I guess the, the subtitle here is really applying the, the Part C methodology to, um, applying it to uh, Ohio DOT and to our safety studies. So this is uh, step two and it's not the full step two, it's definitely a good chunk of it. Um, we'll cover the rest or other parts of it um, next week, but we're really interested in moving on from collecting our data to identifying potential for site safety improvements and possible countermeasures. So the predictive an method analysis process. Um, so this is our technically four parts. One of them is, is data collection, but this is the part of the of the analysis that, that ties back to what Cindy was presenting yesterday on Part C of the Highway Safety Manual, the, the predictive method. So again, the first step is preparation, and that's really determining our data needs and looking at what are our site types in terms of segments and intersections. And we'll go through all of these kind of in depth. Step one, and calculate the predicted number of crashes for base condition. This is using those safety performance functions or the SPFs that Cindy had mentioned yesterday. Step two, calculating the predicted number of crashes for the site condition is applying those Part C crash modification factors, those CMFs that are applicable directly to the SPFs used in um, step one. 
And then step three is um, calculating the expected number of crashes for the site, for the specific site and conditions um, using the empirical Bayes process, the EB process. The, the big disclaimer here is that ECAT will help you complete steps one, two, and three, and it won't even feel like we're working through three separate steps. Um, it's really a great tool and it's very user-friendly. Um, we'll cover it again next week because we want to make sure we, we have enough time to really show good solid examples in there, but it's definitely a user-friendly approach to implementing the HSM um, as opposed to worrying about the nuts and bolts that we're going to go over here in a minute. So in terms of determining our data needs, um, earlier on we had showed that the, the, the two slides for segments and intersections with all those data points. And then we noted there's uh, those few extra data points that we need for the highway safety manual. This is where, again, we have the five-step process, but having a holistic understanding of what your five steps are will help you from having to repeat work. So if you know the site types that you're dealing with at a high level, then when you go to do your field visit or your data collection and you, you need specific pieces of information to work through the HSM predictive method, um, you'll have that for it. So study limits, again, the big one, we need to know what locations we're covering and to what extent. Um, the facility type, the, the study period, and so how many years of, of crash data are we looking at? Um, site conditions, as we covered earlier, and then a big one is these are heavily driven by traffic volumes. So again, um, understanding what traffic volume information you have available um, and what you need to collect to complete this process is really important from the get-go. So the, the next step of applying the HSM process is to divide our, our sites and our locations into homogeneous segments or intersections. So what we're, we're trying to do is say, along our corridor or along our safety study area, um, anywhere that attributes or cross section of the roadway change significantly, we're gonna treat that as one um, homogeneous segment because things that we'll, we'll model and um, things that were th those CMS that Cindy mentioned yesterday that we'll talk about here in a minute, as those change along your corridor, we wanna model those segments differently. So we're gonna make new sub segments um, at the presence of an intersection, when the number of lanes changes, if the cross section dimensions change between lane width or shoulder width, um, if there's a change in alignment, both horizontal and vertical, if there's a change in roadside conditions, you know, as your corridor goes from having a nice 30 foot shoulder with nothing on it to suddenly, you know, that shoulder disappears and it's down to just a few feet until there's fixed objects. Those are two very different safety conditions. And so we wanna make sure we're modeling those appropriately. Um, and so change in roadside conditions and then change in traffic volume. You know, our SPFs are heavily, safety performance functions are heavily driven by traffic volume. Um, and so we wanna make sure that as there's significant changes in volume, we're creating a new segment in um, dividing up our locations appropriately. So again, homogeneous segments are, seg are sections of our roadway where um, our our roadway attributes are unchanging. Um, and when they do change, uh, we do need to create a new segment. And you know that segment will continue until the roadway conditions change again. So a new roadway segment begins where the base conditions change. Um, the base conditions for each site type and each model um, are contained in the Highway Safety Manual. Um, and there is, you know, you do need to get comfortable with referencing the Highway Safety Manual to understand the specifics on how some of these attributes are collected from that perspective. Um, ECAC really helps you identify, oh, I need this specific measurement or I need, you know, this is how angles or skew angle of an intersection is measured. Um, it's definitely built to help the user understand the implications from these conditions. Uh, and then other, after base condition changes, we're also looking at major changes in traffic volume or geometric alignment. The, the key here is major changes. You know, if you have 10,000 vehicles traveling down a corridor and it, it shifts down to 9,500, you know, is that a major change in your volume? Um, and I would say no, um, we're looking for significant um, volume changes. And then the last one is presence of an intersection. We want to create new segments at the centers of intersections and go all the way to the segment, the center of another intersection. So again, the, the sections and the site types really influence when a new segment begins. So you, we have to start to become comfortable with our safety performance functions and our crash modification functions in part C. And you know the best way to do this is to really have the HSM available and work through it. Um, 
over time, it really becomes second nature for, oh, that's going to be a new segment because you start to get used to how the different site types um, are affected by changes in roadway alignment. So one example is if we have a rural two-lane segment, um, the new segment specifically would begin at the center of each intersection um, for horizontal curves, the end of a grade, limits of passing lanes or short four-lane sections, limits of two-way left turn lanes, uh, significant changes in average daily volume or average daily traffic volume, uh, lane or shoulder width are changing, change in driveway density per mile, roadside hazard rating change, and presence of centerline rumble strips, lighting, or automated speed enforcement. So these are the characteristics, the base conditions for a rural two-lane segment as outlined in the Highway Safety Manual. Um, again, uh, specific measurements of these sorts of things are also gone into more depth in the HSM. So once we have our data collected, we've split up our sites into the correct site types. We know this is a rural two-lane segment. We know this is a rural um, converted to a rural multi-lane segment. We know the next one's a rural multi-lane intersection. Um, the, the first actual step of the predictive method is to apply the appropriate SPF. And so the different chapters of Part C in the Highway Safety Manual cover um, your different site types and contain your different safety performance functions. So chapter 12 is urban arterial SPFs. Um, chapter 11 is rural multi-lane highways. Chapter 10 is for rural two-lane highways. And then for each of these, it's both segments and intersections applying to you know, urban arterials, uh, rural multi-lane highways, and rural two-lane highways. So once we find that SPF, then we're going to do the mathematical calculation that it contains. That first step gets us our predicted crashes for the base condition. So again, we're saying without looking at some of those specific factors for our rural two-lane highway or our specific site type, we're gonna get a predicted number of crashes. But then we need to make that base generic site type specific to um, our location. Um, and so this is, though, this is where those Part C CMFs come in. And so we'll have a CMF for, you know, um, is there automated enforcement present? What's the shoulder width? For rural multi-lane, what's the median width? And different values for your median width will have a different impact on safety. And so it's those Part C CMFs that really adjust that base prediction to your site to come up with a predicted number of crashes at your site. And then the last thing that we're going to do here is this, this C on the end is apply a calibration factor. And so in Ohio, um, we have calibration factors for all of the SPFs uh, contained in the Highway Safety Manual. Um, the big thing here is this looks like we've got three different things that we're calculating and multiplying, and we are. If we did this by hand or through an Excel uh, exercise, this would be the steps that we would follow exactly. The awesome thing is that when we go through ECAT, we fill in information about each homogenous segment, and it's going to take care of steps one, two, one and two right off the bat. Actually, it'll take care of step three also. Um, the models are already going to be calibrated in ECAT, so we don't have to worry about figuring each of these pieces out step by step by step. Um, because it takes care of this linear process for us. So again, part two is applying those part C CMFs. Um, so we need to review those SPF base conditions that are outlined in the HSM. And then we need to determine how our study site differs from those base conditions. And then are there part C CMFs that, that get us from the base conditions to our site type? Uh, those CMFs are multiplicative factors, which means, you know, it'll be if if our site type is got a condition where we would expect less crashes, then it'll be less than one. And so the predicted crashes will actually be reduced by the presence of that CMF. Um, if we would expect, you know, a condition at our site to increase the number of crashes compared to the base condition, then that number of that CMF will be larger than one. And so when we multiply the predicted times that CMF, we'll get more crashes. All right, so uh, steps one and two are finding our safety performance function, coming up with a number of predicted crashes, and then adjusting those crashes based on CMFs. Cindy alluded to this yesterday. Um, in the Highway Safety Manual, there are two types of CMFs, and the, the big difference is Part C CMFs and Part D CMFs. They're not the same thing. Um, and the 
just so everybody that's currently like cursing the highway safety manual, um, this is uh, something that will be addressed in uh, the, the second version of the highway safety manual is getting the, um, getting the nomenclature to be a little bit easier to understand. Um, so Part C CMFs were developed in conjunction with the SPFs for the base conditions, and it's, they're, they're meant to adjust base conditions to our site conditions. Part D CMFs that we'll cover um, a little bit later on are, they estimate the effectiveness as a result of implementing a countermeasure. CMFs in Part D should not be used to adjust our base prediction, or should not be used to adjust our SPF to our site types. Um, only use Part C CMFs to adjust Part C SPFs. So there's a lot of uh, nuance there. Um, but the big thing is uh, Part C CMFs are used for the Part C prediction adjustment. So um, we have applied our Part C CMFs to our original base factors. The next thing is to apply a local calibration factor. Um, the biggest thing is that the, as Cindy pointed out yesterday, the HSM SPFs were developed, um, you know, they're not necessarily developed for specific states. They're generic cases from around the country. Um, and so what we have is calibration factors to make them specific to Ohio. Um, so the, the calibration factor adjusts the SPF crash estimates to reflect local conditions for Ohio. Um, so that includes both reporting levels and then weather or other similar factors. And so crash types in California are going to be different than crash types in Ohio um, in certain circumstances. And so we're capturing those with this calibration factor. Each SPF requires its own, cal its own unique calibration factors. And again, all of these are contained within ECAT. And uh, to, th to the third bullet here, they're provided by the Office of Program Management through ECAT. So step three is to apply the site-specific EB method. Um, again, the benefits of EB are really um, reducing effects of regression to the mean. Um, it helps to minimize those, those variations in year-over-year -year crash trends. It improves the crash frequency estimate. Um, it does require having an SPF and historical crash data. So we have to have crash data available to, to get through step three. Um, and then the steps are listed out point by point in the HSM Part C. But um, we will see them next week in an example in ECAT. So the EB method, real quick, um, is uh, this is the formula. And um, the, the good thing is this is a good formula to know and understand so we understand what ECAT is doing. But uh, this calculation is, again, done for us. So our predicted number of crashes that we get from our from step two, really, they're originally calculated in step one. Step two, we make them specific to our site type and to our location. Um, we multiply those times a weighting factor. And then we actually have our observed crashes over at the site that get multiplied by the inverse of that weighting factor. So what is the weighting factor? How do we figure that out? So our weighting factor to tell us, are we going to weight heavily the predicted crashes or the observed crashes? Because ultimately the expected is a blend of them. Um, is based on the models. It's based on the statistical models or SPFs for each site type. Each site type has this K, which is an over dispersion parameter that's unique to each SPF. Um, and it is applied to each predicted, each predictive model estimate for all study years. So the weighting factor is really based on the strength of the model uh, of the SPF that we're using. And so that'll tell us if we're going to weight more heavily the predicted crashes or the observed crashes. This is just another example of how we're exactly applying um, the site-specific EB. We have our weighting factor is right here. You can see this is the same equation where it's our weighting factor times our predicted crashes plus uh, our inverse weighting factor times our observed crashes. So it's how are we balancing between the observed crash history at the site and the predicted crash history. And so this EB um, step really helps us to understand both what's happening at my specific site versus what do we expect that's happening compared to other sites around, really around the state of Ohio for similar site types. And then the last step is to really adjust the average estimate value of the crash frequency to a future time period. And I'm not gonna necessarily break that down, but we'll show how that's captured in ECAT later on. So the big question is, when is the EB method applicable? Um, 
in the no build option, so sites in which the roadway geometrics and traffic control are not being changed. Uh, if the number of through lanes is consistent, so projects in which the roadway cross section is modified, but the basic number of through lanes remains the same. In minor alignment changes, projects where um, minor changes in alignment are made, such as flattening one horizontal curve or um, most of the alignment is left intact. Uh, passing lanes or short four lane sections are added to a rural two lane, two way road to increase passing opportunities. And any combination of these, we can use the EB method. And what we're talking about is it's applicable. Th these are all situations where we're, we are changing or improving, hopefully improving our site from a safety basis, but it might just be any roadway upgrade where we wanna see the impacts to safety. That leads to the following question. Um, when is EB method not applicable? Um, so if we're completely changing the alignment or cross section, um, we cannot use the EB method. Um, same thing with intersections where we are changing traffic control or intersection legs. And that's namely because we are changing the base safety performance function. Um, so we're not making a minor adjustment at that point. We need to have a completely new lens to view these crashes in. So, What's the benefit of this one more time is um, we're, it's one way to incorporate our site crash history and our predicted crashes. And so we are helping to come up with a truer understanding of um, our estimate on crash frequency. We're reducing the effects of regression to the mean and we're un understanding the unbiased potential for safety improvement. And the last part here, the potential for safety improvement is the big thing that I wanna cover with the, the few minutes that we have left. The potential for safety improvement is the difference is the difference between um, our expected and our predicted crash frequency. So in this situation, the blue line is the predicted crash frequency. So this comes after we've finished up step two, we've run through the SPF, we've applied our CMFs and our calibration factors, we're here. But then we go to EB where we apply our observed crash history. And so, if we have a lot of crashes recently, our expected crashes might be higher than um, our predicted crash frequency. When the expected is higher than the crash, or when the expected crash frequency is higher than the predicted crash frequency, we would say that that is an ex excess expected crashes, or we have a potential for safety improvement. We're expecting more crashes here than we would predict, then we have that, that PSI. Likewise, if we have a very limited number of crashes, um, at the site, we would say we have less expected crashes than predicted. So we don't have that potential for safety improvement here. Basically what we're saying is in, in the case of this black line, this site is performing better than its peer sites. And by better, I, I just mean we're, it has a lower expected crash frequency. This PSI and, and finding, you know, does my site have a potential for safety improvement from the numeric level is important. Um, that's one way that projects will be assessed when we go to apply for funding. And it also helps us to understand, you know, we may feel that there is a safety problem here, but from a quantitative perspective, this is how we would exhibit and prove that, yes, we do have that, that safety issue occurring at our site. So um, to kind of wrap it up is we've used the collected data. The first step is to create is to, to calculate the predicted crash frequency by applying SPFs and Part C CMFs. And then the next part portion is to um, determine our expected crash frequency um, using the EB method and seeing how does our local sp site specific crash history play in here. And then the combination of those two will tell us what is the potential for safety improvement at this site. We'll go through all of this again next week through our ECAT example, um, but uh, highly recommend uh, using ECAT in Ohio to complete these calculations. So uh, what we're gonna do with these results is to determine locations uh, where there is a, a potential for safety improvement. We wanna compare the results to our existing crash patterns, um, and then really think about what can we do what can we potentially do to improve this site and reduce crashes? So yeah, one last time, ECAT, definitely we'll go into this in, uh, in depth next week. And one last thing that I wanna throw out there in the, the few seconds that I have left here is this, this idea of EPDO value. Um, crashes all have an inherent cost associated with them. And we can look at crashes by severity based on human capital costs. And so these are numbers that um, are nationally derived and then locally adjusted to understand, you know, at some point we're gonna have to prove why investing in safety is better 
not only from you know a societal standpoint, but from an economic standpoint too, there is a cost associated with crashes. And so EPDO value is one metric that we can use to say, all right, what's the severity of our site? Um, and so basically we can apply um, a, we can come up with equivalent costs for a PDO crash versus our fatal crashes. Um, so uh, basically uh, we would compare what's the difference between the cost of a PDO crash and other crash severities. And then we come up with multiplicative factors. So we can say based on the average human capital costs, one fatal crash is 194 times the cost to, to of human capital um, as a PDO crash. I know we're running right up against the wall, so um, I will cover EPDO rate again in our next um, session. Um, but basically that brings us to the end of module two for today. I really appreciate everybody sticking with us. Um, I know we're covering a lot of information very quickly, um, but next week on Thursday, Cindy will be back to discuss freeway safety analysis and overview, and then the interpretation and documentation of safety analysis. Alex, we do have a couple questions that I wanted to touch on really quickly before everybody sure. logs off. Um, one of the questions uh, that was asked was earlier on, I believe we were talking about uh, new segments and when they begin, and one of the statements was anytime there's a significant volume change. Um, and the question was, what's a significant volume change? Uh, and as I said in my thing, that's kind of a tough one to, to, to be able to provide a specific answer to, it requires a little bit, probably a little bit of a familiarity with the HSM and the sensitivity of each of the models to volumes. Um, but for it's generally kind of um, you know commensurate with the uh, the classification and the volume on the roadway itself. So if you're dealing with a lower volume, lower classification roadway like a rural two lane, that um, that change is going to be a little bit lower, probably in the order of magnitude of a few hundred, a couple hundred vehicles. Whereas if you're dealing with a larger type of facility, higher classification. Um, like a urban arterial or multi-lane or freeway, you're probably looking at something towards the magnitude of a thousand. But that's where the HSM can be really helpful. There's some charts and graphs and stuff that are in there that you can look at and then becoming a little more familiar with the sensitivity of the models themselves to changes in volumes is going to help you understand, you know, when you really need to, um, you know, identify something as a significant volume change. Um, the other one was, uh, talking about the differences between Part C and Part D CMFs. Um, and this one is a complex thought and a complex idea. And um, the more and more familiar you get with the HSM, the more comfortable um, this one becomes. But the easiest way to say it is that all Part C CMFs are included in Part D. Um, so it's a really a matter not of the parts and where they're included, but it's the methods that you're using to apply them. Part C CMFs are only used in the context of taking it from converting your model or the results of that safety performance function output to something closer to your site. So that's the predictive method. That's the predicting crashes. I'm trying to determine what my site actually looks like or will look like in the future, given the conditions that I know about it. And those CMFs in Part C are tied specifically to the safety performance functions. So they're developed with the safety performance functions and they're unique to each of the safety performance functions. So that's how we use the Part C. So again, it's more about method than where they belong. The Part D CMFs, what those are used for are to actually say, okay, now that I have a good starting point, so one thing that probably wasn't really touched on um, and, and should be a point, the whole point of the HSM predictive method is to give you a new place to start from instead of your historical crash data. Like I spoke about yesterday, um, using historical crash data might be a little short-sighted, might not give you all the information you need. So what you're trying to do with the HSM predictive method is get you to a better starting point from which then you can evaluate the impacts of potential safety improvements. So that's what the Part D is about. Part D is about evaluating, okay, now that I know where I'm starting from, I know, you know, what, what my future would be based on, you know, that combination of the model and actual crash data. Now I can actually start to evaluate if I start making changes to those conditions. And the Part D uh, application is about testing those types of situations. So you're going to obviously anything in Part C, you know, lane changes, lane width changes, um, number of lanes, um, 
you know, anything, uh, shoulder width, all of those things in Part C, those are still things that you're going to do in the Part D process, but you're going to have a whole bunch of additional CMFs that are really, uh, they're valid, uh, independent research-based CMFs, but they aren't any of the ones that were developed in conjunction with the Part C safety performance functions. So hopefully that gives a little bit of explanation as to um, the whole relationship between the two. Like Alex mentioned, they're gonna really clean that up and, and explain it a little bit better in the HSM too, so that it's a, it's a little clearer in terms of the understanding and that um, you know Part D I think is actually going away um, in the HSM too in, in its current kind of, um, well, it's going to be there, but it's not going to be the same approach, and the, and the explanation is going to be a little bit better. But that's really what it's about. It's how you're using the CMFs um, and where they come from. That's whether they fall in the Part C or the Part D category. All right. Well, thanks, Cindy, and thanks, Alex, for presenting today. And we look forward to Parts 3 and 4 of this course next week. So thanks, everybody, for attending. Thank you. Oh, and there was one more quick question about getting the HSM. Unfortunately, okay. um, Ashto and and through Ashto and that group, um, that's going to be the best um, method to go about identifying the location of getting the Highway Safety Manual. So NCHRP Ashto. Um, I can't remember where I ordered my last one, but if you go to the Ashto website for the HSM, they're going to tell you where you can purchase it. All right. Thank Thanks, you. everybody.